Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about how 50 centrally protected monuments have gone missing. We also give you an update about the case where an Air India passenger urinated on an elderly woman. But first, we talk about Joshimat, a small town in the state of Uttarakhand, which is an important transit point for people travelling to pilgrimage sites like Badrinath. The town has been in the news because last week, reports emerged that huge cracks had appeared on roads and over 500 houses in the area. The town, it appeared, was slowly sinking into the ground. Since then, Chief Minister Pushkar Singh Dhami has issued several directions, including the building of a rehabilitation centre and evacuating danger zones. Now, cracks like these have appeared in the past as well. But in this segment, we speak to Indian Express's Amitabh Sinha about the reasons behind them and what is different this time. Amitabh, for those who may not have seen the images for it, could you describe how big are these cracks and and what kind of damage are we seeing in the area? So, a lot of these photos are doing the rounds on social media, also on various media websites and also. The cracks have appeared on the walls of the houses, on the floors, also in public spaces. You can see uh, some of these cracks on the roads, in the fields, at some of the places. Now, I must say that this is not the first time that these cracks are being observed in Joshimat. We have seen such cracks that used to appear earlier as well, and not just in Joshimat, but also in some other towns of Uttarakhand. So this is not something new. There isn't something that has happened in the last four or five days or in the last one week, which has led to the emergence of these cracks. Several such incidents have been reported, both in Joshimat and also in uh, you know some neighboring towns, some other towns of Uttarakhand. So this is not new. But, you know, I've spoken to a few people, few locals who are there and they do say that this year the new cracks that have emerged, also some of the old ones that have got widened, they look much more dangerous, much more serious than the previous ones which have been appearing over a few years. So this time it does look to be a little more serious, much more dangerous and more bigger. And so tell us what is the reason that these cracks have appeared in the past and are widening now. Right. So, as I said, this is not new. It has been happening and it's very well known, understood, and it's also been documented. Now, coming to this specific case of Joshimat. Now, Joshimat is about 6,000 feet above sea level. It's a small mountainous town, small hilly town. The importance of Joshimat in more recent years has been because it's the gateway to lots of pilgrimage centers, the big ones being Badrinath and Hemkunt Sahab. There are also a lot of other shrines that people go to and Joshimat actually becomes the hub of a lot of pilgrimage flow in Uttarakhand. So it's an important town. It's an important tourist destination as well. Now, coming to the cracks, there are three or four things that scientists attribute these cracks to. One of the most important things here is that Joshimat is actually developed on deposits of old landslides. You know, there have been major landslides that had completely flattened the area. At that time, I mean, the town wasn't there. We are talking uh, at least 100, 150 years ago, somewhere around, you know, 1850. uh, People say there used to be uh, some major landslides, earthquake triggered landslides that had happened, which had like flattened the area. And the town has been built on that. Most of the town has been developed on that. Okay, so because the town has been built on soil that came as a result of landslides, would that mean that the soil would be very loose? Yes, so that is why it is important. So essentially, the town is standing on relatively loose soil, which is, you know, relatively soft compared to the topsoil in in other towns or cities that would be expected. So what that means is that it's not very well equipped to handle large structures, buildings. No, relatively speaking, it's not habitable at all. It's not that it cannot support structures. We are talking in relative terms. So it's relatively unstable. So that is one. The other thing, again, 
an equally important factor is that this area and not just this area, I mean, it's most of Uttarakhand is uh, also, you know, earthquake prone. It's in the highest earthquake seismic zone. And this area has experiences relatively, you know, frequent tremors, small and big. Not all of them are reported. Not all of them are very big to cause damage. But there are frequent tremors that emerge in this area. And these tremors, even though they might not be causing any damage uh, outside, they do lead. Uh, that also means that there is a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure inside, uh, you know, the, beneath the ground, beneath the surface, because of which these tremors, tremors are essentially a release of energy that's packed uh, beneath the ground. So when these tremors come, that also leads to softening of, of the soil, the general instability in the ground. So these two are the big things. And there are other reasons as well. Okay, so built on loose soil and the fact that this is an earthquake prone area. But the other thing you mentioned in your piece is that a lot of unplanned urbanization has taken place here. So talk a bit about that. Yes. So, you know, has been unplanned, lots of it done in an unscientific manner, unregulated. And we have seen these kind of things becoming a contributory factor in other kinds of natural disasters that have happened in Uttarakhand as well. You know, so again, this is uh, not unique to just the cracks, but about the general problems that are afflicting Uttarakhand and which are making Uttarakhand one of a disaster prone state. So whatever these human activities that are there, they act as aggravating factors in a situation which is already very fragile. So we have all these aggravating forces which is leading up to the pressure building. And these cracks that we see are actually a manifestation of some of this energy or some of this restlessness uh, that is there beneath the surface. That restlessness getting out, getting expressed uh, some of that energy getting released. And that's why we are seeing these kind of cracks. Now, the again, these are very well documented, has been happening, just that this time it seems much more serious. And it's the accumulated things that are coming out now. And right now, Chief Minister Pushkar Singh Dhami has given a bunch of directives. There are plans for evacuating people and building rehabilitation centers. He also spoke to PM Modi yesterday, who assured him that all possible help will be extended to Joshi Mutt. But talk about what are the biggest concerns for the people in the area right now? Yes, so people we have spoken to, they say it's a matter of huge concern now. It's a very serious situation. Not the entire town, but maybe some pockets in the town and quite a few pockets in the town are probably in a state now which make them extremely dangerous for human habitation. And uh, there is this tremendous risk of those areas either caving in under their own weight or uh, you know, leading to landslides. There are some forecasts. I mean, it's not very unusual. There would be some rains in January as well. Then the monsoon season would be approaching in a couple of months. You know, heavy rainfall is not very uncommon in this area. So if once the rains come, you no, know, it could trigger landslides. And some of these areas in, in the town, also in the neighboring areas, there is this fear that some of these areas can cave in, can lead to tragedies, probably are not very safe for uh, human habitation right now. So in terms of response, or what is happening you know, these days in, as an immediate response measure is to at least get people out of these danger zones, right? So some amount of evacuation is happening from the risky areas. And this is going to be a painful process of you know, people getting uprooted from their traditional villages and you know, places where they have lived for uh, generations. And uh, probably they will have to be moved somewhere else. And that's what is happening uh, currently. And there is very little apart from that that can actually be done. You now, these are geological forces at work it's not possible to actually do a patchwork on these cracks. You cannot counter these geological forces. Also, in medium term, probably what is being thought of is at least do a very rigorous assessment of which are of the risks, the varying degrees of risk in this town, also in other places, so that you can regulate the kind of activities that happen in different areas of the town. So maybe this would be a wake-up call wherein you know, at least this would lead to some strictness with the, you know, kind of implementation that we see 
in terms of how you know activities have to be regulated and next we talk about the case of missing monuments last month the ministry of culture informed the parliament of something that seems rather unusual it said that out of the 3693 centrally protected monuments 50 had gone missing in fact the archaeological survey of india or asi which is in charge of protecting these monuments says that 24 of them are untraceable which means that no one can find them but how can this happen how can centrally protected monuments suddenly go missing in this segment indian expresses divya a joins us to answer this question divya before we talk about this case could you first tell us what exactly are centrally protected monuments so centrally protected monuments and sites are those sites which are around more than 100 years old and these may include temples cemeteries inscriptions tombs forts palaces step wells even objects like cannons and coast minars that may be considered of immense historical significance to the country these monuments are regulated by an act passed by the parliament called the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act okay so we know that asi is in charge of protecting these monuments so what does that entail what is asi required to do so the archaeological survey of india or asi it functions under the amasr act So according to the provisions of the act ASI officials are supposed to regularly inspect these monuments to assess their condition and apart from various conservation and preservation operations ASI is also empowered to file police complaints issue show cause notices if there are any encroachments that they notice and uh, also communicate to the local administration if there is a need for demolition of encroachments So if ASI is in fact in charge of protecting these monuments talk about how 50 of them have gone missing because that really does seem implausible as dramatic as it may sound this is not something which would have happened suddenly or overnight but while it was happening it was never reported because of a lack of proper physical verification by the ASI that is obvious now lost 50 of our monuments and maybe there are more i uh, see the a bulk of the protected monuments were taken under the asi during the 1920s and 30s up till the 50s around the independence but uh, as asi officials claim that in the decades after independence the focus of the government was on health education infrastructure and not so much on protecting heritage So in due course many monuments and sites were lost to activities like urbanization constructions of dams and reservoirs and even encroachments ASI officials admit that a comprehensive physical survey of all the monuments has never been conducted after independence Right and ASI recently gave a breakdown of these 50 monuments including 24 which seem to be untraceable So talk a bit about that as per the asi submission in the parliament 14 monuments have been clearly lost to urbanization mane the maybe the roads were built maybe the houses came up maybe the colonies were built and those monuments were demolished by authorities and they lost or by private builders and they're gone then 12 of these uh, monuments have been submerged under reservoirs and dams and they are also clearly lost but when we talk of the 24 untraceable monuments these are uh, the ones that you know are still not traceable but still not deemed lost also i mean we have no clue where are they they may be found down the line but as of now the attempts have not yielded any results but won't there be any documents or something that tells us about their location i mean they can't totally be untraceable right see the main thing here is that the records on paper and the records on ground are not matching for instance if the records say that on xyz plot number in xyz district xyz location such a such monument exists and if officials really go to that location no monument exists in that case what they can do is they can just find out where is it was it ever existing here what happened because 
over the years there was no constant physical verification so they don't know whether the monument was there when did it get lost how did it get lost did somebody demolish it did somebody pick it up did somebody take it away you know it could be anything but just that they were never in touch so they don't know and could you give us some examples of these monuments that are now untraceable so the untraceable monuments include 11 in up then there are two each in delhi and haryana and also in remote states like assam west bengal arunachal and uttarakhand asi officials say that many such cases pertain to smaller items or objects like inscriptions batteries and tablets in which case the location would have been moved or somebody would have just taken them away and asi had not posted security guards to you know guard them at the right time so other missing monuments also include the kinds of guns or of emperor sher shah in assam there was a a copper temple in arunachal pradesh and this entire temple is missing there is kos minar or uh, mile pillars in haryana which are missing mile pillars are something that sher shah built at the time the national highway was being built then there are also some rock inscriptions which are reported missing then there are some tombs in maharashtra which are missing there is a small temple 12th century in rajasthan's baran this which is missing so these are the kind of things that are untraceable also what do we know about the attempts that the asi is making or has made to find these monuments so asi has submitted to the parliament that they will soon once again give it a one last shot using various technology like aerial surveys then physical verification land record matching and try to look for these untraceable monuments once again but in case they can't find it then they have to be deemed to be lost like the ones which are already lost to urbanization and uh, you know submerging under the water and what happens if they can't find them will they be removed from the list of protected monuments see according to the provisions of the act it's not so easy to delete a monument from the list because it requires denotification and in denotification you have to prove why a monument now ceases to be of national importance which may not be the case here so it's quite complicated it's quite a first time thing so they have to figure out how to go about it but clearly there would be some provision to say that these are lost monuments or untraceable monuments or these are denotified because they are lost and divya is this the first time that this is happening where we are seeing monuments becoming untraceable yes and no so uh, asi as i already told you never itself on its own initiative had a physical verification of all the monuments on its protected list but it was in 2013 that cag the comptroller and auditor general they had conducted a survey of some asi monuments and out of those monuments they had reported that at least 92 centrally protected monuments across the country are missing Also is there a fear that more monuments could go missing in the future See the CAG audit was done only some 1600 monuments of the total 3600 monuments that are on the ASI protected list So if one had to do or if ASI had to do or some agency had to do a survey of the rest of the monuments one is sure that more monuments will be reported missing or untraceable from the ASI's existing list they would have been gone and uh, in order to protect the other monuments which exist which are there if the security and physical verification aspect is not taken care of the future we may end up losing many more monuments and in the end we talk about the air india urination case last month shankar mishra who is 34 years old while traveling on an air india flight between new york and new delhi allegedly urinated on an elderly woman passenger after getting drunk according to the woman when she complained to the cabin crew they cleaned her seat and provided her with a change of clothes but allegedly did not restrain the passenger or file a complaint against him later a complaint was filed by the airline but this happened after over a month when a 30 day flying ban was also put in place for the accused since then mishra an employee of the us financial services giant wells fargo has also been fired from his job with the company saying that they find the allegations deeply disturbing 
also the Delhi police on Wednesday filed an FIR on charges of sexual harassment and outraging the modesty of a woman and finally arrested him on Saturday. When we spoke to Indian Express's Anand Mohan, he gave us more details. So, following the registration of the FIR, as we all know that the police had launched a search operation trying to trace where Shankar was staying at the time. Eventually, through examination of his uh, CD, uh, of his call details record, they figured out that he, he was in Bangalore and they uh, arrested him from Bangalore. After his arrest, they produced him before uh, Metropolitan Magistrate Anamika at Patiala House Court. He says that at the court, the police requested for a three-day police custody for Mishra because they wanted to interrogate him. Their main case was that this uh, that Shankar was deliberately avoiding the investigation and that he did not join the investigation. So that's one of the reasons why they moved the three-day police remand. So, and at the same time, uh, Shankar's lawyer, advocate Manu Sharma, had opposed the remand. He had said that, you know, that uh, since there was already a disclosure statement on record and the fact that uh, he was already arrested and, you know, that the crew members' statements can be recorded and there were no other co accused in this case, there was really no uh, reason to send him to a police custody remand. The woman's lawyers had also turned up for the hearing and they had uh, strongly asked for a police remand because they said that, you know, that uh, Shankar had been delivered deliberately avoiding the investigation and that there was a need for the police to interrogate Shankar under uh, police custody. The Metropolitan Magistrate, however, denied this request, saying that there was no requirement for his custody since the police had already taken a disclosure statement from him. The disclosure statement, we must also say, that has no evidentiary value during trial. But, you know, the the, the court said that his disclosure statement is there. The crew, you are already, you have examined some of the crew members. Some crew members that you can already examine while Shankar is in judicial custody. And uh, the court had said that, you know, that police custody is not a punishment, which is a very important point to make that, you know, that uh, the court had acknowledged that there is public pressure on this case. But the court said that we'll go by the law and not by public pressure. And the court said that, you know, that if during his time in judicial custody, if at all some circumstance arises where police feels like we know that we have to procure his police custody, that that can also happen. But till then, there was uh, absolutely no requirement for a police custody and he was sent to judicial custody. So his lawyers have moved his bail application, which will be heard before the court on January the 11th. And till then, Shankar is going to be in judicial custody till the time his bail is been decided by the court. Anand also says that Mishra's lawyer had told the court that a lot of noise has been made in the case and that IPC Section 354 was not made out. Section 354 is assault or criminal force to a woman with intent to outrage her modesty. However, the court was of the opinion that, you know, that uh, this is not the stage to discuss whether this session is made out or not. And has also uh, said that, you know, we'll discuss this on a separate date. So all eyes will be on uh, January when the bail application of the accused will be heard and uh, the following arguments uh, regarding whether the session uh, 354 is made out or not is also expected to be heard. Meanwhile, DGCA, the aviation watchdog, has given a show cause notice to Air India and said that the conduct of the airline appears to be unprofessional and has led to a systematic failure. We also heard from the Air India CEO Campbell Wilson last week, who informed the public that the airline had taken action and de-rostered one pilot and four cabin crew members over the incident. He also added that Air India could have handled the matter in a better way. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it, share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.